Okay, you're going to find that I have the least technologically savvy and uh, video embedded presentation of all of them. What I'm actually going to spend some time doing is telling you a few stories that I've used in marketing through projects that we've done. So, okay, little question here, show of hands. Who here is over, let's say, 55? There's a couple, okay. Um, who here is under 55, but I would say over 35? Okay, good chunk. And what about under 35? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you three stories. And there are three stories about one neighborhood, which is Riversdale. And depending on the age you are, I'm guessing you've heard a different story. So let's go back in time. For the, one, for the people that are over 55, the, the, the story is, uh, maybe I'll just explain the picture. Here's Riversdale. Here's Vendasta, right here. The red dots are where we've done projects with my company. As you can tell, I have, uh, uh, we have a rule in my company is that we won't touch a project if we can't walk to it from our office on 20th Street. So it means we work in a very small area here in Saskatoon. And so we're deeply involved in that neighborhood. So here's story number one. If you're over 55, you probably heard this story. Riversdale is a neighborhood that is working class. A lot of um, local owner operators Names like Edelman or Canigans or Joe's or Walters mean something to you because those were the owners of some of those businesses. And it was very much um, a neighborhood, uh, kind of a self-contained neighborhood that was very poorly connected to downtown because of the railroad tracks. It was its own area. Lots of Eastern European families that were there, lots of Asian families that were there, which all goes back to very early... Um, uh, 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 kind of subdivision of the neighborhood. It was a more affordable neighborhood than the east side of Saskatoon, which is where the temperance colonists kind of set up. Um, this was the story of Riversdale. Now, if you are closer to my age, so I'm 39, if you're in that band in the middle, you probably grew up hearing a very different story. You heard a story of if you grew up on the east side of the city, and I have to generalize some things, there's always more de nuanced details to it, but you probably heard, I've heard these things a million times. If you grew up on the east side of the city, you're probably told, don't cross Idlewild. Don't venture into the alphabet streets, Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C. Um, it's not safe. It's scary. It's dangerous. There is prostitutes there. All of these things that had some basis of truth to it because the neighborhood went through um, challenging years, dark times, and some people grew up with that truth. Um, I do a presentation at the um, Edwards School of Business to an entrepreneurship class, usually once a year, sometimes it's two years in between. And I was there a couple of years ago and I said, I said something about, okay, I'm, we're gonna do it here. Who here knows what the Berry Hotel was? Show of hands. We're maybe half, right? I was at a, I was at a, a, a school or a, a, at a class, and I said, "Who here has heard of the Berry?" I said something about the Berry Hotel, and there was a look of confusion. And I said, "Who here knows what the Berry Hotel was?" And there was one student in the class, and my eyes opened up because I realized that I was speaking to a generation that had grown up with hearing a different story than what I had heard. So. I, see, for me, I remember some of those old businesses, but I also saw, saw some of the real challenging times in that neighborhood. But it was when I heard one story, and this was about 2006, 2007, I was, uh, I, I, I was uh, talking to an architect friend of mine who is from Toronto, and she said something to me. This, this might not mean anything to you, but what she said is, she said, she's from uh, York, like Toronto, north of Toronto, and she said, I like 20th Street West. And I said, oh, really? Tell me why. And she said, it reminds me of Queen, Queen Street West in Toronto in the late 90s. Does anyone know what that means? The riffraff guy might know. Rory might. So... That meant something to me because I, like Rory, I'm a musician too. And I used to have a band called Five Minute Miracle and we toured across Canada and we played on Queen Street West at the Horseshoe. We played at the Elmo Combo, uh, Silver Dollar Lounge and Queen West in the late 90s 
was vibrant. It was cheap. There were used CD shops and record shops all over the place, and it was gritty, but it had a great life to it. And when this friend of mine, Jilling, when she said, that reminds me of Queen Street 10 years ago, I knew exactly what she was saying. And my perspective and understanding of what the potential was of Riversdale changed like that. And I immediately saw it. And, and that was a watershed moment for me. Because I always had believed, you know, there was maybe potential there. But she gave me the lens to look through that I had never had before. So, we started doing projects in Riversdale. Um, I'm, so, slide number two. This is, was not our first project, but our first major project. This is what I had to work with. So, let's go back in time again a little bit. We have uh, Randy from the Riversdale bid is here, and I've been working closely with him for a long time, and he's going to be chuckling, and you know, because he laughs at some of the things that I get myself into here. Um, this is 2010, and in two uh, yeah, 2010. In 2010, I'll tell you that there were not a lot of success stories coming out of Riversdale. In my opinion, there was actually one, and it was the Roxy Theater had reopened, and they'd done a great renovation. It's a beautiful atmospheric theater. There was one success. The Park Cafe was going as well, but there wasn't a lot to work with. So we bought this building, and I had I had to ask myself. What are we up against here? We're up against a perception. We're up against deep set. We're up against a story that has been told for a long time that we want to change. So we have to start telling stories of our own, right? So the first story I told, as you can see, this is what I had. I didn't have a lot to work with. I didn't have a huge track record. I didn't have um, a, a pile of money to throw at a building. What I had were two friends. That was Crystal Buchert, who did the architectural design for us, and Darren McLean from Territorial, who did marketing for us. And I worked really closely with, the, with both of them. I still have great relationships with them. I said, well, what is this? Well, this is going to be an office for Darren and Crystal and I. It just happens to be way too big, and we need to make some more friends. So I said, well, we're collaborating on the design of this. I guess this is a story of collaboration. We started telling a story of collaboration uh, with the 220 before we had done anything. We were actually squatting in this building next door, working there while this was under renovation. The story of collaboration actually got a little bit of um, attention. There was one little media, you know, a, a CTV interview or something like that that was like 30 seconds on the news. And my the landlord here, the next day he said, hey, yeah, good article. It's, it's good to hear someone saying something positive about the neighborhood. That, that was the first. And I, in a slip of the tongue, I said, yeah, you know, hey, it's good in the hood. And slip of the tongue. And the next day, Grant, who's like a great designer, Grant Unruh, he, he came back and he had buttons that he made up. He said, you said good in the hood yesterday. He said, I like the sound of that. So I made you 20 buttons. And I looked at it and there's this funny little button. I said, oh, interesting. That me, that, that got a bit of traction and somehow the word got out a little bit and people like residents in the neighborhood started walking into my office here saying hey can I get one of those buttons and I was like what is going on and it was nothing more than a story in, in words and it was at a time when nobody was saying anything good about the neighborhood someone said hey you know what yeah this is a rough area a rough neighborhood but this guy's saying something good I'm with them. And they started coming and taking buttons and we probably made a couple hundred of them. Um, so that's what we had to start with, was very much a, 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 you know, a, a organic uh, start to the project. So six months later, we actually had a building or a new facade on it that we could present. Truth be told, by the time we got it looking like this on the inside, 90% of the inside we hadn't even touched yet. The only thing that we had done was the facade, the little co-working space, and collective coffee, right? So we were starting to build, uh, build a community here, right? Is that, this is Jordan at Collective Coffee. So um, that, that idea about collaboration, that is actually what resulted in the naming of Collective Coffee. There was a spirit we wanted to embody and enable and we knew that the collective coffee is going to be the um uh 
the, the, the binding force, the social glue that was going to hold the neighborhood together. A cup of coffee is the cheapest price of entry into any neighborhood and it was going to be a landing point. So here's my story about collective coffee. And this is, this is when we start to get into the fun stuff. Um, I've, I've realized over the course of a number of projects that um, buildings, um, so I'll say it this way. When buildings get torn down, people are upset. My belief is that it has actually nothing to do with the bricks and the mortar and the physical building and the heritage nature or whatever. It has to do with the loss of memory and the loss of point of reference, the loss of great times. When Lydia's came down, the building, you know what, it was going to come down on its own. And, and, and I, I could see that happening outside looking at the structure, but I have so many good memories in that building. And when it went down, I lost the reminder of those memories and those good times. So what we started doing with Collective Coffee is I started looking for ways to harvest memory, to harvest emotions and to harvest stories out of that neighborhood that predated the tough eras in the neighborhood. When you look at this picture, has anyone, I'm guessing some people have been in here. Does anyone know the story about this thing? This is like, yeah, Dale, you know, this is like, you know, if you're like cost engineering and optimizing and trying to be a smart developer and that you don't build anything like this because it weighs about 500 pounds. It's not reusable and it's a behemoth. I'll tell you where this thing came from. There used to be uh, a, a shop in the West Industrial Area in Riversdale called Saskatoon Vinegars Limited. They had big vats. They made vinegar. That's what they did. A friend of mine, James Hopper, salvaged a bunch of these vinegar vats that were made out of fur. And I found out that he had this salvaged wood. I'm like, great, salvaged wood from the neighborhood. Can I get some? He said, yeah. He said, you just have to be careful cutting it, though, because when you cut it up, you release all the ammonia that's embedded in it. So he said, you kind of have to wear a gas mask. So all of the wood, the, all these stains and all that, that's from, the, from when they were vats. And this is the tongue and groove edges that we cut off. So all of the wood came from the neighborhood. And then all these steel rails. Does anyone remember Toon's Kitchen? So Toon's Kitchen was, from my understanding, the only late night, one of the only late night restaurants, or maybe it was 24-hour restaurants. I've heard crazy stories about parties and food fights that happened there. They had a dumb waiter in the building to take the food from the kitchen on the main floor up to the second floor. And earlier on, I had bought this old church building, and the guy that I bought it from, which was this artist named Tim, he totally suckered me into just inheriting the dumb waiter that he had salvaged and had in the basement. So all these steel rails, I basically had a bunch of wood and a bunch of steel elevator, dumb waiter elevator rails, and I gave them to an artist named Jacob Semko. And I said, do you think you can make a counter out of this? And he's a guy who's always up for a challenge. He said, yeah, yeah, I think we can do it. And that's what we came up with. So there's actually a deep part of history of the neighborhood that that's in there. And what I've realized over time is I'm very good at telling stories but sometimes I need a lot more horsepower to actually get the stories out the door because this is a story that I don't tell very often. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, so that's part of the story that we started telling people about, about collective coffee, about history of the neighborhood that go, went back a hundred years and how we were reharvesting some of those things. Next. So, you know, I always say if you, um, if you pour enough beer and wine into any social situation, you can get it to start combust and you start to get some body heat and, and things started to happen. And the story of the 220 evolved because it was no longer just Darren and Crystal and I and Jackson from Collective Coffee. It was, holy shit, now we have 179 members that are at the 220. And it transitioned from being me and a couple people doing something to the story of, well, let's talk about the power of a community. That spirit of collaboration is so deeply embedded at the 220 because we're there. I'm there like 40 hours a week minimum. And we have really um, uh, brought that into the spirit of the people who have, who have come in and joined us. So we started telling this story of a community and how the, the 220 was a place for ideas, people with ideas to get traction for them. Um, and whether they had 
a non-existent budget or a great budget to work with, our doors were open to anyone. That's what we've always tried. We've tried to be super accommodating in that regard. And we've tried to give um, support to um, our tenants that have good ideas. So we started telling the story of community. This is on bike to work day. Uh, bike to work day just happened again last week. And it was, a, it was the busiest one for us yet. It's fun. It's a good time when our community spills out onto the street in front of us. So the story evolved. Um, the story continues to evolve. Because I always say we're looking for new, we are always looking for new stories to tell. This is, so this is just a, a week ago or two weeks ago. Maybe, maybe it was last Tuesday. We just built something called a parklet in front of our building. Does anyone know what the story is of this? Yeah. 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 So I like fighting with city council. I think it's one of my 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 real best habits is I love getting up in front of them and saying, what are you guys doing? Like, get out of the way. We want to do something and just like, psh, get, get out of the way. So I, had, I wanted to do this two years ago and I gagged at the cost the city imposed on it. This year, we managed to get them to bring them down some and I said, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet and we're going to build this. But the story is very simple. This is public space. There is no cost of admission. This is not for collective coffee customers. They can use it, but this is for anyone to use. And it is, it, I, we're, we're trying to, to prove a point and to advance an argument with the city that says, this is not about a loss of parking. This is about building a great city. This is about building a happy city. This is about building a city that serves everyone this is a little thing that we've done and i'll tell you it cost me like seven and a half thousand dollars to build this and i put no value on my time it makes no financial sense at all that's that's the honest to goodness truth collective coffee would have to make something like um an an, an additional hundred and forty thousand dollars in coffee to justify building this they're obviously not going to do that i paid for it but this is about building a great city for people and it's it's actually cheap but the city thinks that they have to you know put up roadblocks and there's about loss of parking and all this garbage and i keep saying enough bullshit right it's like get out of the way let let businesses let entrepreneurs do these things so this is the current story although the uh, the the post that i put up about this that got the most traction was me saying uh parklet um great for quality of life bad for office productivity because there's a lot more you know, uh, re another reason for people to step away from the computer and hang out outside in the sun now than what they used to. <clears throat> I have one more slide. There's one last story that we're telling, and this is a very, very important one, and it's a big one for us right now. In, within our company, we are, I'm sure you can understand that um, being so active in Riversdale, which is a neighborhood that has a high First Nations population, that we have, we recognize that there is um, there is a real um, spirit that we need to bring to our projects and to deeply embrace the impact that our projects bring to that neighborhood and understand it on a very deep level. So I never shy away from conversations about gentrification because it's something that people love throwing out there, but it is an unbelievably challenging thing to have a conversation about, especially on social media platforms. So we are telling a story about reconciliation. And this is really, really important stuff. And a, a year ago within our company, we said, you know what? We're in the middle of this culture. We see First Nations uh, uh, cultural things coming about. We've been in, I mean, we bought both of our buildings from Saskatchewan Native Theatre Company. And at the day that we completed that transaction, we said, okay, well, we don't like the fact that we just displaced you. So we're going to support your programming. And we've, we've supported shows and that and attended their, their performances for a long time. Um, and that's that what op that's what opened the door. But a year ago, we said we need to learn more about um, the history because we actually we hear you know little things about residential schools and you just you can't stitch it all together. You don't know what's going on. So as a company, we said we're not going to try to fix because trying to fix is the worst thing. We're going to try to learn. 
and to understand. And so within our company over the last couple of years, um, but really in the last 12 months, we've embraced that deeply. The reason I put this up, this is my, that's my tape measure. That's, that never leaves my desk, that's important. <laughs> this is why I put the picture up. This is a painting by Kevin Pace, who is a local artist. Um, we, he's been the artist in residence at the 220 for the last year and a half. I've bought probably 10 of his paintings. We have it in our boardroom. I have them in my, in my house. He's a great artist. We've been, um, uh, we've been um, doing everything we can to um, support um, First Nations entrepreneurship, artistic endeavors, whether it's drama or art or um, learning about ceremony in that. My, my wife, Carrie, uh, has been deeply, deeply involved through Reconciliation Saskatoon, which is a group that's predominantly not-for-profits and churches and First Nations groups. We're actually the only for-profit company at the table, and Carrie has been doing all their like media and communications. It has been mind-blowing in terms of what we have learned from that experience and in understanding a different frame of reference in that and so you'll you when you look at our company you'll see a, a fair bit of stuff that comes out talking about hey there's the uh, rock your roots walk for reconciliation thing happening on june 20th or 21st i'm gonna get that wrong i know I, I, it's one of those days 21st um and 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 this is like important stuff so that's a story that we're in the middle of telling now we're trying to tell some of the stories about that those cultural endeavors that we're just discovering and we want to share it with our community. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's my story to tell. Thank you.